Hey everyone, in this video we are talking about software. Now software is essentially computer data just like any other type of file that you would have on your computer. In fact, I really want to emphasize that software really just is a file. It's stored on your secondary storage device on your hard drive or flash drive or something like that and it contains computer data that is interpreted as instructions that tell your CPU exactly what operations it needs to do in order to perform the actions that the software is supposed to perform. When you actually run a piece of software, what the computer does is it loads that software into your main memory, uh, typically into your RAM, and then it will start executing the instructions contained in that software. Given that software is a file that is stored on your secondary storage that is loaded up into your main memory, just like every other file that we have, it is completely comprised of binary numbers. And those binary numbers are just ones that the computer is able to interpret as instructions in order to run that program. Now, because a program is a file, just like any other file on your computer, you can actually find its specific location within your hard drive. As you can see right here, I have Microsoft Excel um, that I'm going to open up in Notepad just to see what things look like in there. And if you open it up, you'll see a whole bunch of gibberish with like a little bit of text for things like errors or things like that, but it's a whole bunch of gibberish. And this is uh, my text editor, Notepad, specifically trying to interpret all of those machine instructions as pieces of text, which doesn't unfortunately work out very well for it. Uh, you have a whole bunch of weird symbols and text, and we have really no idea what this is saying, but if someone was more familiar with the actual machine instructions, they might actually have a better idea of what's going on behind the scenes here. Unfortunately, I'm not, so I can't really give any um, sort of explanation as to what each of these uh, little instructions is doing right here. But in the end, software is computer data. It is stored as a file. It is loaded into main memory and then it is executed by your CPU. So we've talked in the past about several different types of software, and I'd like to go over that again very quickly. Um, your operating system itself is software. It is computer data. The files for running your operating system are actually stored on your disk, and then it is loaded up into memory, and the CPU executes instructions from the operating system in order to actually run your operating system. This is true for Windows, for Mac, for uh, Chrome OS, every flavor of Linux, every single operating system is in fact software. We also have drivers. These are the programs that um, are in charge of interfacing with physical devices that you have connected to your computer. They might be physically connected, they might be virtually connected, but typically they are physical devices. So for example, if you have a, print, a printer connected up to your computer, you have a driver that tells your computer how to communicate with the printer in order to get your papers printed on that printer. Same thing goes for your mouse, for your keyboard. Uh, a lot of storage devices might have drivers. Oftentimes there's generic drivers that a lot of devices can choose to be compatible with. These generic drivers will be really helpful because it means you can plug in all sorts of different types of, let's say, mice or keyboards or something. And as long as they're compatible with a generic driver, you don't have to install specific software in order to handle that particular device. This wasn't always the case and it ended up kind of being a nightmare um, because then, you know, you would buy a new keyboard and then somehow have to go download the driver for that keyboard, possibly on a computer that doesn't yet have a working keyboard because 
you're trying to download the driver for it. So oftentimes drivers would come on CDs that you would have to put into your computer and load the driver software from. And then from there, you, know, you would actually be able to use the keyboard that came with your computer. And nowadays with um, CDs not really being a thing, these generic drivers are much more prevalent and it makes things a lot easier. Systems programs are another excellent example of software. So these are programs like the ones that control where your mouse is or that detect when you click your mouse, what you're actually clicking on and the action that should be taken. It kind of passes that mouse click along to the application that you're clicking on. Um, your desktop manager is a type of system program that manages things like where windows are displayed, not like windows as in the operating system, but your application windows, how those are loaded up and displayed on the screen, how icons on your desktop uh, are placed there and what happens when you double click on those icons, those little shortcuts. They might also handle things like your taskbar. It really depends. Um, you don't really see a discrete desktop manager in Microsoft Windows or Mac OS or Chrome OS, any of those kinds of operating systems because they, um, you know, that's all kind of built into this operating system that's very closed and not really all that configurable. Um, you see it a lot more in the different Linux operating systems that are out there because you can actually kind of swap in and out different pieces. You can swap out your different systems programs in order to have more control over your computer's experience. System programs might also be things like the programs that help copy and, pay, or copy and cut uh, files. So in Microsoft Explorer, for example, if you copy a file from one folder to another, Microsoft Explorer itself isn't typically doing that copying. Rather, it's usually just an application uh, front where you, it makes it easy for you to tell the computer you want to do the copying and cutting and stuff like that. But then it will pass down that information to a system program that actually handles the copying or the cutting of that document. So it's sort of a front end that says, hey, you know, the user you as the user can use me to tell the computer what file operations you want done, and then it'll pass that information along to something lower down. We also have applications. Applications are the type of software that you probably are most used to thinking of as software. This would be stuff like the web browser, Microsoft Word, Microsoft Excel, Microsoft Access, Microsoft PowerPoint, uh, Windows File Explorer, Notepad, all of those are applications. They are essentially meant for the user to, you know, load them up and do some kind of purpose with. At least that's in the traditional sense, the user would load them up on their computer and do some kind of purpose with them. We'll talk about the different types of applications that are out there in this modern day and age, but Typically, an application is just, hey, this is a thing that does a certain purpose that the user will then access in order to do that certain purpose. Words has the purpose of creating documents. The user will load up Word in order to create a document. Excel has the purpose of making a spreadsheet. The user will load up Excel in order to make a spreadsheet, and so on and so forth. We also have what's known as firmware, which is a type of software, but it's referred to as firmware because it's software that kind of acts like it's much more of a part of hardware than our typical idea of software is. And I'll explain more about firmware later on in this video. Now, as for applications, we tend to have two main types of applications. We've got native applications, and we have web applications. Now, the difference between these two types of applications mainly rests in, is the computer that's running the application 
the same as the computer where the user is interacting with that application. Here's what I mean by this. If you've installed Microsoft Word on your own computer, then when you run Microsoft Word, what you're doing is you are opening it up, your computer loads Microsoft Word into its memory, your CPU starts executing commands in order to actually run Microsoft Word, and then you're interacting with Microsoft Word on your computer. On the other hand, if you access Microsoft Word through the online version, through that Office 365 link on your My Hancock portal, what you're accessing there is a web application. Now, the computer that is actually hosting this web application is going to be a server, and the server is going to be the thing that's actually running a good chunk of Microsoft Word back there. That's That server is going to be interpreting keystrokes and clicks and formatting the document in a very specific way based on your instructions. You are giving instructions on your computer, but rather than those instructions going directly to the act to the application, they're being passed through the web and then they go onto the uh, server so that the server can interpret those inputs and actually make the changes on its side of the application. So the native application is the one that you are running on your computer. The web application is the one that's being run on some kind of server and that you're interacting with typically through a web browser. Now, I want to stress that in both cases, native and web, these are both software. The web application, you have software that is being loaded up on the server's end, and you have software that is loaded up on your end. You have your web browser, which is a piece of software. Your web browser also is getting instructions from the server and then passing those instructions into your computer. So that then is still software. This whole thing is software. The only difference is whether or not it's sort of an all-in-one package, which would make it a native application, or whether or not you're interacting with it on one computer, but then the actual behind-the-scenes work is happening on the server computer. All right, so now let's take a look at operating systems really quick because we've talked a lot about operating systems. I've mentioned a lot of these operating systems, but I really want to focus in on this table that is provided by Experiencing MIS because they are completely wrong about something. Specifically, they are completely wrong about Linux. They push Linux as it being one unified operating system the same way that Windows is one operating system or Mac OS is one operating system. And that's not true. There was a point where Linux itself was one operating system, but then many people actually went and made improvements in different ways and they made their own sort of quote unquote children of Linux. And then that kind of splits Linux up into a whole bunch of different operating systems there that are descended from Linux. And then people made more changes of those operating systems and people made more changes of those operating systems and so on and so on and so on. And there's probably dozens, if not hundreds of Linux operating systems out there that are all contained under the Linux family because they all well, they all can trace their lineage directly back to Linux. There are a lot of different Linux operating systems out there, a lot of operating systems in the Linux family. The most popular is probably Ubuntu, along with several of its children. Um, there's Xubuntu, there's Pop OS, there's Linux Mint. Um, all of these are really popular because they are extremely stable and relatively easy to get into. You don't need to learn much in order to go from being a full-time Windows user to a full-time Ubuntu user. So they're very popular for that reason. There's a lot of other Linuxes out there too. There's uh, CentOS, 
there's Gentoo, there's Fedora, there's Arch Linux, there's OpenSUSE, all kinds of distros. And typically they have some sort of reason for existing. They fill some sort of niche. And I'll try to talk about some of the niches as we go through this operating systems table. But in the case of something like Arch, that niche is customizability. You can include or exclude exactly the programs that you want or don't want. Uh, in the case of Gentoo, it would be, you know, it's a very hard operating system to use because every single program that you install, you are custom building for your machine, as opposed to a Windows program, which is already pre-built given a specific operating system, a specific type of processor. So you're actually custom building something for your machine with the idea that it will probably in the end run faster, even if the actual installation process is really rough. Um, I'll talk about uh, a few more as we go on through this table. I also want to say that for all of these different operating systems categories, we have non-mobile clients, mobile clients, and servers. In theory, any device would be able to run any operating system. The thing that limits it is making sure that that operating system is actually able to run on the specific hardware. If companies really, really wanted to, let's say if Microsoft and Apple really decided to go in on a partnership, you probably could get Windows 10 running on some of the more powerful iPhones. It would just be a matter of rewriting Windows 10 programs so that they could be run on the iPhone processor. Because different types of processors require different types of machine instructions. And that's a whole, uh, a whole rabbit hole that we could really get into that I'll try to stay clear of. But when it comes to operating systems here, this is what we typically, typically see in real life. Now, when they talk about non-mobile clients here, what I'm assuming they're referring to is specifically desktops and laptops here. And when we take a look at desktop and laptop operating systems, you do see Windows, you see Mac OS, formerly OS X. Uh, you, you don't really see Unix anymore. Unix is kind of dead because it's been replaced by all the many variations of Linux that are out there. And then, of course, you know, the, the many of the Linux variations are used as well. Uh, most of the time with Linux, you'll see Ubuntu or its derivatives, Xubuntu, Kubuntu, Linux Mint, Pop! OS, all that kind of stuff. You'll, you'll see them used a lot. Uh, Arch Linux would also be a good contender. Um, OpenSUSE, which is known for being extremely stable. Debian is sometimes used on non-mobile clients. Uh, what else? Gentoo and Fontu. Those are some of the really, really crazy ones if you have like very specific uses for them. But those would often be on the you know desktops and laptops as well. For mobile clients, you have iOS, Android, and Windows 10 mobile. Um, Windows 10 Mobile these days does not really have, there's not really a difference, or at least much of a difference between regular Windows 10 and Windows 10 that you would see on a tablet like the Microsoft Surface tablets. I think this is a bit older information because I, I also don't believe Nokia phones are really released that offer Windows 10 Mobile anymore. So typically on a tablet now, you would see full-fledged Windows 10. Maybe there are extra driver programs on Windows 10 Mobile that aren't on the desktop version, like drivers that handle touchscreens or pen input or all that kind of stuff. It wouldn't be necessary on a desktop or on most laptops unless you specifically have a touchscreen and use the pen with it. So you might not see those programs bundled in on the uh, on an actual desktop or laptop that comes with Windows 10. But those are the typical mobile clients. Now, under Android, I, I will say, actually, Android is a 
another uh, variant of Linux as well, interestingly enough. It's a very, very, very different variant. It has heavily diverged away from its origins as a Linux uh, variant, but it is a Linux variant. And there are variants of Android as well, uh, because Android itself has a core uh, open source system and then Google took a whole bunch of stuff from the Android project and added their own things in and made it their kind of mobile operating system. But there are alternate operating systems that use uh, altern- alternate versions of Android. They remove all the stuff that Google put in there and then they build their own version of it. That's going to be Lineage OS and Graphene OS. And as of the filming of this video, I actually use Graphene OS on my phone, mostly just because I could. And then iOS is iOS. I, I wish I could tell you more about the uh, lineage of iOS, whether it was based on something or not based on something, but I, I don't really know that so well because Apple kind of keeps a very, very tight hold on iOS. Oh, speaking of Android being Linux-based, though, we actually have... Um, Something similar with Mac OS. Mac OS is actually based on Unix. Uh, it has heavily diverged, and it's not really much related to the current Linux projects, but it was a Unix system, and there's a lot of similarities in how Mac OS works at the very, very, very base, close to the metal side of things, as there are, uh, as the um, the ways that Linux works as well. So they're somewhat close together, although not completely related. And then Windows is not connected to them at all. And then finally, for the servers, we have um, Windows Server Edition. Uh, that is a, a special version of Windows that Microsoft puts out that has, you know, it, it has specific features for being a server it has some optimizations and it doesn't have a lot of programs that you might actually see on regular windows because it's not being used as a actual um you know personal computer it's instead being used as a server so you wouldn't see programs on windows server that sets a desktop or that controls a mouse or that controls windows uh, you know application windows actually showing up on the screen or anything like that because in the end it's just running on a server. It doesn't need to do any of that. That would be up to the client computer to handle all that kind of stuff. Unix was a server operating system. It is not being used anymore as a server operating system because it is extremely old and that would be a massive security risk to do that. So instead, people use different flavors of Linux. One of the most popular server operating systems in Linux is CentOS, um, which is entirely built to be a server. A lot of people will also use things like Ubuntu or Debian or something like that. They'll just modify Ubuntu or Debian in order to make it better for a server. There's also Arch Linux servers are somewhat popular within certain circles because Arch Linux is so configurable. Um, so you'll see a lot of those different types of servers. I actually know people who personally choose Debian or Ubuntu for their servers, and those work fine because they're not doing like a huge, huge server project that's going to be accessed by a ton of people. It's more they had a spare computer lying around that they loaded up uh, Debian onto and set up a server so that they could stream uh, movies from their server onto any of their computers that they wanted to. So Linux is very, very popular as a server computer. All right, so let's now talk about a very cool subject, which is virtualization. One physical computer can actually host multiple virtual computers and the way that it does that is it sets up a well a virtual computer it sets up virtual hardware and then tricks an operating system into thinking that it is running on real hardware so the operating system 
will try to do some sort of interface with the hardware. It'll make some kind of request to, let's say, display something on the screen. And that request will be intercepted by the computer that's actually running the virtual computer, interpreted, and then actually handled in a way that is beneficial for the user who is hosting that virtual computer. Um, let's say if the virtual computer, the operating system is trying to make a request to access some piece of information from the internet, that request, instead of going to the Wi-Fi router in the computer, would instead go to the, um, would instead be intercepted by the program that runs the virtual machine. And then that program makes that request to the real Wi-Fi antenna and the real computer gets that data, it, it's, you know, gets whatever data comes back from the internet and then passes it along back to the virtual computer. And the same thing kind of happens for things like keyboard or mouse presses. If you're trying to type something into a form on a virtual computer, the application that is hosting the virtual machine is going to intercept those keyboard presses or mouse clicks or mouse movements and translate that to um, an actual keyboard press or mouse click in the virtual machine. It'll pass that along into the virtual machine and then the virtual machine will interpret that however it would interpret a keyboard or mouse click normally. Now, there's a lot of different reasons why this can be really useful. For example, uh, let's talk first about PC virtualization. What this is, is a person creating a virtual machine to host a, at least, you know, one virtual computer inside of their own computer. Why you might want to do this is, let's say you have a Mac computer, but you need to run some Windows programs for whatever reason. You can boot up a virtual machine, which has a Windows 10 operating system loaded up on it. And then from there, that virtual machine should be able to run that Windows program, no problem. It should be able to do everything just fine. You can access whatever you need to access within that Windows program even though your real computer is a Mac. And that can be really, really helpful because sometimes there are different programs that ha are specific to one operating system and you need to actually boot up an instance of that operating system in order to access that program. So if you need Mac specific programs and Windows specific programs, at the same time, it can be really helpful to say, have a computer running Mac OS on it with a virtual machine that has Windows. Now it's hard to go the other way around where you have a Windows computer that has a Mac OS virtual machine, specifically because Apple guards Mac OS extremely tightly. So it's really, really hard. Actually, I would say it's impossible to legally obtain a Mac OS image that you would be able to use in a virtual computer, unless I'm mistaken and Apple offers that now, but it's really hard, especially since Mac OS is also very persnickety about what hardware it's running on. So it's even hard to install Mac OS on any computer that wasn't even built by Apple. Usually, if you need Mac and Windows stuff at the same time, it's going to be easier to have a Mac OS computer that runs Windows um, on a virtual machine. I've actually done something similar. Um, primarily, I'm a Linux user, and there were times where I would only need Windows programs occasionally. So I would uh, make a virtual machine with Windows on it and then run those Windows programs on there. and as time went on, um, especially as I started teaching, there's just some software that I need to use that works a little bit better on Windows than it does Linux. So now instead I just have a 
Windows partition and Linux partition on my computer. I have both operating systems installed on my computer and when I turn it on, I can choose which operating system I'm running. But then if I wanna switch operating systems, I have to turn my computer off and on again. That's another benefit of virtualization is that you don't need to actually turn off and then turn back on your computer in order to use a different operating system. You can just have a virtual machine going. Now, another, or at least a downside to using a virtual machine is that it is very resource heavy. If you're running a virtual machine on your computer, you're essentially running an entirely new operating system on top of the operating system that your computer already was running. And not only that, you're running the virtual uh, machine application, which is then handling things like interfacing between the operating system and your computer. Like it's emulating the hardware so that the operating system, the virtual operating system thinks that it is running on a real computer. And that all takes up a lot of resources. It takes up a lot of processor power. It takes up a lot of memory. The storage can be, storage requirements can be pretty high as well, depending on what you're doing with it. So that might be in the dozens to hundreds of gigabytes if you're really going hard with a virtual machine specifically with PC virtualization. So it has its upsides and its downsides, but it's worth paying attention to. Oh, another uh, benefit of PC virtualization, and I would recommend really only doing this if you know what you're doing, but you can use it to test possibly unsafe programs inside of this closed off virtual machine that doesn't have access to the rest of your computer. So if you download a program, you want to make sure it's not a virus. You could spin up a virtual machine. You could plug that, you could stick that program in the virtual machine and then see what happens when you actually run that program. And if things go bad because it's a virus, well, it's contained to that virtual computer and you can very easily undo any sort of damage that it might be doing on your actual hard drive because it's not really doing any damage, it's just messing with the components on this virtual machine. So you can relatively easily prevent it from accessing your real computer. Now, the reason why I would say to be careful about this is that this doesn't 100% mean the program is safe. Maybe it has some way of detecting that it's on a virtual machine that we're not really aware of yet, so we would have to be very careful with that. But it's one method that a lot of security experts will do in trying to determine if a program is unsafe, is boot it up in a virtual machine and see what happens. So it has a lot of uses. The next type of virtualization we'll talk about is server virtualization. Now, this is a really interesting case, and we'll talk a little bit more about it in chapter six when we're actually talking about servers more. But with server virtualization, you have one server that is pretending to be multiple servers. It is running multiple servers within one server. And the reason why that might be helpful is you could essentially partition all of the things that are stored on a server between all of these virtual servers. One example might be you have a business with one server, but it runs three virtual servers, one for like marketing department related stuff, one for logistics and operations related stuff, and one for human resources and accounting related stuff. So they're all able to access stuff on their virtual server that they're using. But, you know, there's no way for them to access things that they maybe don't want to, or even might not be allowed to access. Could be really useful if you have very sensitive user data that you're using for, let's say, marketing purposes or something like that, but you don't want just anyone in the company accessing that kind of stuff because that could be a privacy viol violation. So you only, you stick it on one virtual server and you only allow certain people to access that virtual server. Uh, it does take up resources to run these virtual servers. It takes up more resources than having three separate physical servers would, 
but sometimes that's not an option. And in that case, uh, server virtualization can be really helpful. Another reason why that can be really helpful is because if something goes wrong on one of those virtual servers, it doesn't actually affect the real server or any of the other virtual servers. An example of this is back when I was a student at Cal Poly, we had virtual servers that were assigned to us as students that we could complete our homework on. And there were four virtual servers that we were allowed to use. These were virtual Unix based servers. I believe they actually all ran CentOS. Um, but what would happen is eight weeks into the 10 week quarter, the students that were taking a systems programming class, a class that was about advanced ways of interacting with the operating system, those students would learn about something called forking, sort of like the um, utensil. But what it does is you have a program and then you clone it. So then you have two copies of that program. And the idea is you want to do that so you can multitask to some extent. However, if you're not careful, you can clone the program, but you clone the program right at the point where it clones itself. So then you end up with one program becomes two programs, becomes four programs, becomes eight programs, becomes 16 programs, and so on and so forth. And the more programs you have, the more system resources this is going to take. The, the, uh, program, the server is going to run out of memory because it has so many copies of all these programs. It's going to run out of processing power because it's spending so much time trying to handle all of these copies of the program that these students would make. And it would essentially crash the entire virtual server. And anyone who was working on that server is no longer able to work on it. They lose all, like whatever unsaved progress they were working on. Their programs slow to a halt if they're testing things and the server just completely dies. Crashes and it burns and it's unable to do anything anymore. And the nice thing about that is, you know, you have that, let's say uh, that server number one has been fork bombed. That's the name of it is fork bombing. Uh, server number one is fork bombed, but you can move over to server number two or three or four and keep on going. So it's really, really helpful. And of course, you know, a lot of students would fork bomb the first server, be like, oh, hey, I wonder why the server is not working anymore. That's really weird. And then they, they would go on to the second server and then fork bomb that, and then the third server and fork bomb that, and then the fourth server and fork bomb that as well. So typically they would take out everything, but if the student was conscientious and realized, oh, that might have been my fault. Let me test my code on my own computer before running it on the server again. You know, there's always the possibility that one server crashing doesn't affect the other three servers, and then more students can work on those servers and actually get their work done. So that is the benefit of server virtualization. And now we get to the cool one, which is desktop virtualization. Sounds a lot like PC virtualization, maybe, but it's quite different because with desktop virtualization, what you're doing is you have a server that's running multiple complete desktop environments. And this is actually what those virtual desktops are if you have actually accessed those through Alan Hancock, because what you're doing is you're connecting to a server that's running multiple instances of a Windows 10 computer. That's desktop virtualization. That is a server running multiple virtual Windows 10 computers. And it's really helpful because of many reasons. Um, for one, if you don't have access to a Windows computer and you need full Microsoft Office access, for example, when we start working in Microsoft Access, uh, you will need full Microsoft Office access on a Windows computer and there's no way of getting around that, well, this allows you to remotely connect to a desktop computer that will allow you to do all of the Microsoft Access work. So that is super helpful. 
Another reason is that you can run really intense programs on server hardware that you might not be able to on local hardware. So you could connect with like an iPhone or something like that, connect to a virtual desktop like this and actually run full fledged Windows programs. So that's a really neat benefit as well as it helps you not have to worry about your own device's capabilities and instead you can rely on the capabilities of the server. What it also means is that the organization that runs the server that's hosting all of these virtual desktops can actually put all of the programs that you would need on those virtual desktops without needing to worry about every person getting a copy of all of those programs on their personal devices and making sure that those programs will work on the personal devices and making sure that those personal devices actually have the ability to run those programs, whether it's by way of operating system or by way of hardware requirements. So this allows for a organization to very easily just specify what hardware needs to be on these devices and then allow people access to those devices. It's also really nice because it's remote access, so you can access those devices from anywhere. With the uh, Allen Hancock Windows computers, you can access those from any conceivable place where you can get connected to the internet. You don't need to rely on being on campus and touching a physical machine. And it's probably going to become a lot more popular as we keep on going. It'll be a lot cheaper for businesses to get, say, a whole bunch of really cheap devices, like cheap tablets or laptops or something like that, that they can give their employees access to, and then they can access these virtual desktops in order to do work that requires any amount of actual power or a specific operating system or something like that. So it would allow businesses to say, order a thousand Chromebooks for all their employees, much easier than it would be to order, say, a thousand uh, Apple laptops, which is something that a lot of programming companies have done in the past, at least the ones that I've worked for. Now, I wanna talk about the actual process of obtaining programs and specifically when it comes to paying for them, you don't buy programs. Well, depending on what the EU has to say about it, you know, currently you don't really buy programs. Instead, what you're using is you're, you're buying a license to use the program for some amount of time. It might be an indefinite amount of time. It might be for a limited amount of time. An example of this is when you purchase your MyLabIT access and the e-texts and all of that kind of stuff. You're not actually buying a textbook like, like you might have back in the day. You are buying access to an electronic textbook and an electronic learning management system. So you don't have any sort of ownership over the software you have access to a very specific like access you have access to that software for some amount of time and the reason why you're buying licenses instead of actually buying a piece of software comes back to some of the early days of uh, businesses getting into software development you know, originally software development was entirely open source, more on that later, but then businesses started getting in there and started trying to sell software in order to make a profit. And people were really confused about that, slash also very angry about that, because back in that day, it was considered very uh, not cool to sell software that you were developing, because... Well, it's all computer data. It's not a physical thing that you can touch. So how would you own it? How would you be able to sell it if it's not a physical thing that you can touch? And people got around that kind of idea by selling licenses to access software. You buy 
um, you buy something, let's say a CD containing software back in the day, or even like a floppy disk containing software back in the day, and you own that particular CD and floppy disk, but you don't actually own the software. So in order to legally use the software, they also included a license that gives you the terms in which you are able to use that software. You know, you're able to use it indefinitely, but you can't copy it, you can't redistribute it, especially not for profit, um, all that kind of stuff. And that's where the idea of software licenses kind of came from. And we still use that today. And in fact, now, um, businesses are trying to take this idea of licensing things to a new level and trying to apply it to things like physical hardware or physical objects that you own. There are um, earbuds out there that you pay a monthly cost for in order to renew your monthly license for those earbuds. And when you stop paying it, the company remotely breaks them essentially remotely fries them. There's a self-destruct mechanism that completely destroys them and you can no longer use them. So people are taking this licensing thing outside of the digital realm and into the physical realm. But this is where we're at with licenses right now. If you are a person in a business who's in charge of buying a bunch of software, you will be buying licenses. Now, large organizations will actually negotiate a site license. An example of this is Alan Hancock grants students access to Microsoft Office 365 for free because they were able to negotiate with Microsoft a larger license that applies for all, um, all members of the university. So that license grants any current student and faculty the ability to use Microsoft Office 365. Um, so that is the kind of thing you'll see in any large organizations. Alan Hancock has a lot of these different site licenses that are very worthwhile. I would highly recommend checking out some of the software that is available to you. Um, larger universities will have even more uh, site licenses that they will be negotiating. And businesses will kind of do the same as well. A lot of businesses will probably be doing something like this for Microsoft Office 365 if those are programs that are being used by a number of people in that business. It's going to cost them some larger uh, fee in order to maintain that site license, but it might be more worthwhile than to maintain individual licenses for individual employees. And then when those employees quit, canceling those licenses and then bringing on new employees and giving them new licenses and all that kind of stuff. So a site license has a lot of benefits if you're a large organization. Now, the funny thing is as well is that free software comes with licenses. You've probably seen license, license agreements when you're actually installing any software on your computer. Um, this is going to be things like the terms of use, um, the terms of redistribution, whether or not you're able to redistribute that software, uh, whether or not you can steal code from that software if you're able to actually get the code from the software, and there are ways. Um, usage terms as well. You'll see a lot of like media players specifically prohibit the use of pirated media with their software just to... Uh, cover grounds, you know, legal grounds, but all software typically has licenses. Now there's a lot of different types of licenses. Um, you have public domain or the equivalent of public domain. So of course, public domain is the idea that after a certain amount of time that the, that a thing, any, anything has been created, uh, it eventually goes into public domain, which means that anybody is able to use that thing however they want. It's the reason why there's a lot of movies about, say, Dracula or Frankenstein or all that kind of stuff. Um, because the that work has gone into the pub public domain since it's been a very long time since 
the original books were published and now anyone can use anything from those books in their own works and the idea is to maintain some sort of creativity. Now public domain is obscenely long uh, thanks to Disney mostly and it might actually grow even longer again specifically because it always happens to get longer. The, the amount of time before a work enters public domain seems to get longer around the time that Mickey Mouse is getting close to entering public domain. I don't remember what public domain is off the top of my head, but I believe it's the lifetime of the author plus an additional, um, I want to say 20 years after they die. And after that amount of time passes, 20 years after the author dies, then anyone can start using that work. Um, one notable piece of literature that has gone into public domain very recently as of the filming of this video was The Great Gatsby. So if anyone wants to do anything with The Great Gatsby, you're allowed to. But the idea with public domain is that anyone can do anything with that creative work. They can completely rip it off, they can take bits and pieces from it and use it in their own thing. And you have what's known as public domain equivalent as well, which is a work that has not entered public domain, but the licensing allows anyone to treat it as if it is in public domain. An example of public domain equivalent would be uh, the CC0, the Creative Commons Zero license, where there's zero restrictions on what you can do, you can just use it however you want. Now there's permissive licensees. Uh, what this allows you to do is you can use software with a permissive license however you want. You're also allowed to relicense that software. So for example, if you are creating a program of your own and you use a piece of software with a permissive license as a component of it, you're allowed to relicense the whole thing, including, including that software that you used from someone else you know and then distribute it how you want and you see this a lot in a lot of the i guess software infrastructure of the internet has permissive licenses where you're allowed to include pieces of that software inside of your own products because those pieces might be necessary for things like communicating with the internet now the difference between public domain and permissive license is that permissive license, you actually still have to say, you know, I use this component from this person. Whereas public domain, you could yank it all, completely incorporate it into the thing that you're making without credit. There's no need for credit whatsoever. The copy left type of licensing is specifically involving, um, you know, if you use software that has a copyleft or protective license, then you the thing that you're making with that software needs to be open so that people can actually see kind of what you're doing. And this is more of a software thing where people will make copyleft licenses in order to prevent um, big companies like, say, Microsoft or Amazon or something like that from using it in software that they sell or or at least software that they uh, keep behind closed doors. So a copyleft license essentially requires it to only be used in what's known as open source software where people can actually see the code that is being written to make that software, see exactly what's going on and maybe even make their own changes to that software. This is opposed to non-commercial software, which forbids it from being used in anything that generates revenue. So if you are running a business and you're looking for some piece of software to assist you in making money, you cannot use non-commercial software. And it's very important that you check licenses so that you make sure you're not using non-commercial software because that would be really bad. Proprietary licenses essentially work like normal copyright. They forbid you from recreating the software, from redistributing the software, all that kind of stuff. And they allow a company to hide the code that they use in order to actually create that software so that it can't get rebuilt or something like that. 
And then there's the trade secrets. Uh, these are the ones that um, you never actually hear about. So Microsoft releases Word and Excel and Access and all that kind of stuff under proprietary licenses, but the trade secret would be something that never even gets released to the public. A lot of companies will make internal software that never gets released and is protected under things like non-disclosure agreements and stuff like that. Some of the projects that I have done working for software companies would be considered trade secret type of licensing because they never got released. They were just used for internal testing and things like that. All right, so finally, I want to talk a little bit about firmware. I alluded to it before, but we're going to have a very brief discussion about what it is. Firmware is software that is installed into read-only memory. What I mean by read-only memory here is I'm talking about some sort of main memory, which the CPU is able to easily access. The main memory that we're familiar with is RAM, random access memory. You can put data on that memory at any spot in the memory, and then you can take data off of that memory. You, you know, you can read what's on there and then you can overwrite the data that's already there. So RAM is actually considered to be a read write type of memory. This is opposed to the read only memory, the ROM that we're talking about here. Read only memory specifically means that you can't write to that area of memory. You can only read it and see what's there. A type of read only memory you might be familiar with is a CD or DVD because you put information on there when you initially burn it. And then unless you have a rewritable CD or DVD, Typically, they're not rewritable, but then you can only read from it. So it's a read only memory. Now, in this case, when we're talking about firmware, typically it's going to be some kind of chip that's electrically connected directly to the CPU, directly to the processor that's running this whole device. So it's going to be software that is very easy to access. It defines core operational features of that device. One example would be BIOS. The BIOS on your computer, if you're familiar with what BIOS is, and you might not be because it's a very technical thing, but if you've ever had to open up the BIOS menu in your computer, that actually would have something to do with accessing the firmware of your computer. And in this case, in your computer, what the firmware does is it actually helps the computers start your operating system for the very first time. When you turn on your computer, it doesn't just automatically start the operating system. It actually has to have the computer, the processor go to the right area on your storage disk and start loading up operating system information. So that's what the firmware does in your computer. In your printer, the firmware is going to control well, all the behavior of it. So receiving data through the cord or through the internet, if it's a wireless printer, it's going to handle all of that. It's going to handle putting the print head in exactly the right place, the paper in exactly the right place. It's going to handle everything that needs to happen in order for the printer to print what it needs to. It has a lot of applications in um, smaller computers as well, like the really small computers that control small devices when we get into the internet of things. So your smart thermostat will probably have a, com will have a computer with a lot of firmware on it that controls all the, well, thermostat controls and so on and so forth. A great example of firmware actually would be things like video games. So back when video games were included on cartridges on systems like the NES or SNES all the way up to things like the Nintendo Switch or um, you know, the Nintendo 3DS and Nintendo DS, all that kind of stuff. If you are playing games off of a cartridge like that, that is essentially firmware. There is software installed into read-only memory that dictates how a specific game needs to be played. 
So that is something you may have encountered if you are a gamer. Now, it is possible to change or upgrade the firmware. Even though it's stored in read-only memory, there's often something called flashing memory, where you can actually put new data onto a read-only chip. And it's a very, very dangerous procedure. Um, so typically, this is only changed or upgraded by IT professionals or, you know, very foolish people who overestimate their own skill and then potentially break things. I'm not saying I've done this, but I have been known to be foolish around electronics before. But there's a lot of very smart people out there who are able to do all this kind of flashing stuff and unlock some really incredible um, features inside of devices that you might not have ever thought about them. Some of the video game modding community in particular has some people who can do some really neat things with flashing read-only memory in order, in order to change or unlock features in devices or actual games themselves. So if you're interested in that, that's the direction I would think about going. Well, with firmware, we wrap up our entire discussion about software. It's very involved, I know, but there's a lot of inf information to talk about when it comes to software. So I hope this was helpful for you. The last thing we're going to talk about is a probably much shorter video on open source, because this is a discussion that I think is really important when you're choosing software for yourself and for your organization and one that I don't necessarily agree with the textbook on. So if you enjoy the drama between me and the textbook having different opinions, then we can look forward to that.